Okay. And we're probably about good to start anyway. If somebody joins us later. There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. I am Marion. I am from the Outlands, uh, specifically the Barony of Kerta, and uh, that's the Denver region. And today we're going to talk about color changes in medieval pigments. So a little bit about me. Uh, I've been in the SCA about 21 years. I've been doing illumination for about 15 and pigments about four. I am not a chemist, uh, but I will share with you uh, what I know. Um, I am currently also the Kingdom Arts and Science Minister for the Outlands. So if you have any ways to improve the Outlands, let me know. So we're going to go through a whole bunch of changes. Some of them are intended and some of them are unintended. The intended ones, we're going to talk about creating a lake pigment, pH sensitive changes, anthocyanins, uh, turnsole or folium, blue to green, green to blue, all the different colors. Lead can change, which was really important back then making vermilion, how you burn earth colors, and metal salts. And if you have a question at any time, please either just shout it out or type it in the chat. And uh, I like to know where you guys are and if you have any questions. So we'll start out with making a lake pigment. And this is a really fun one. Uh, as I was saying to a few people before, it. Things are foaming up and bubbling. It's great fun to make. So uh, Cennini in the Craftsman's Handbook or Il Libro dell'Arte calls the creation of a lake pigment like weld an alchemical process. So that's our first connection to alchemy. Uh, what a lake pigment is, is just extra extracting a dye, usually from an organic like insects or plant material, either stems or flowers or leaves, and combining it with alum and uh, some sort of calcium carbonate and making a precipitate. Uh, what that comes down to is you're taking a dye and making it into a pigment. And the difference between a dye and a pigment is a dye gets into those fibers and becomes integral to them, and a pigment just kind of sits on top of it and you usually need a binder like uh, gum arabic or glare to get it to stick there. Uh, so uh, if there's the chemistry for you. Alum plus potassium carbonate equals a transparent aluminum hydroxide and alum plus calcium carbonate like um, ground seashells, ground eggshells, uh, marble dust, chalk, that kind of thing you're going to get a transparent aluminum hydroxide and an opaque calcium sulfide. So that's kind of why we add calcium carbonate a lot of times is to make it more uh, opaque. And we can do a lake with all sorts of things, everything from weld to Brazil wood to cochineal, all different kinds of things. And some of these are pH sensitive. Uh, one of these is matter. You can make a lake pigment out of that. And if you um, add different chemicals, you're going to get anything from an orange to a pink. And there are many different chemicals in this, everything from alizarin to purpurin, pseudopurpurin. And these have different light, light fat fastness. And light fast means how resistant it is to fading in direct sunlight. Um, Brazil wood is also another one, and uh, Brazil oxidizes to become Brazilian. There is a recipe in uh, one of the uh, manuscripts in medieval treatises by uh, Merrifield, and that gives four different colors. And we'll be going through those later. Uh, I have some of the chemicals uh, that they use to make these different colors. Uh, I can't find my cream of tartar, but we'll get to see some immediate color changes. 
Uh, we do have a question in chat. Awesome. Uh, there are different scene and extent examples that can tell us how it was dyed. Do things dyed a specific way, fade a specific way? Uh, so we can't always pick out which um, plant was used in a lot of manuscripts. A lot of times, if you're just looking at the color, uh, it's a lot of guessing and uh, the spectroscopy that they're using to figure out what colors are, are not real good on organic chemicals. So some of these are pretty hard to figure out. Um, the extraction method definitely determines what color you're gonna get. Um, um, and like some chemicals in matter are much more light fast and they're gonna stick around more. Uh, Alizarin is a nice light fast one and some of them not so much. Uh, but it, if you make enough pigments, you can figure out uh, which ones are um, being used or a general idea, if that helps. Okay, moving on to anthocyanins. And this is a group of chemicals. Uh, they are pH sensitive and can result in anything from red, blue, or purple. Um, things like, uh, and a lot of these are made into clothlets or things like that. Um, something like poppies can result in either violet or red. Uh, all different colors there when you're, uh, depending on your process. Uh, corn flowers, they start out blue and depending on what you add, they're gonna turn different colors. Uh, bilberry is a lot like uh, blueberries and usually results in a blue or violet somewhere in between, depending on what you add to it. And elderberry is another one, which is kind of a purple color. And before you move on, we have another question. Absolutely. Um, will some dyes pigment change between if they're used on vellum, pergamanta versus silk or silk slash linen fabric? I am not sure. Um, mostly what I've tried things on are paper and uh, vellum. Um, and the pigments I've made seem to work better on uh, vellum, uh, but I have no idea with uh, fabrics at all. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind my sneaking in as a dye sure. person, um, sure. you do generally get similar colors, silk versus linen, uh, but you get uh, different intensity and different fastness. Um, so. The colors are usually similar in the dye process, but not uh, not anything else. Awesome. Okay, turnsole or folium. Uh, this one has made kind of a big uh, to do in the last year or so uh, because they have kind of helped to isolate the chemicals that make uh, turns uh, folium turn like a purple, uh, the plant, Tim, the, the plant, <laughs> please excuse me, my son's having a hard time. Uh, the plant is called Crozophora tinctoria, and that's the little triangular uh, seeded uh, plant in the corner there. Um, also known by a lot of different names, but when you hear turnsole in a manuscript, it may or may not be this plant. If you hear of something that has three seeds, three lobes, something like that, uh, it is likely this plant, but it may not. Uh, turnsole was a term that was used for all sorts of different cloth lids. Um, so it could be something like uh, blackberry or poppy or something like that. Uh, but the crozophora can be anything from red, blue, or purple. And the chemical that they have isolated is crozophoridin. 
Um, so if you expose this to something acidic, uh, like vinegar, or they used urine a lot, you'll get red. Something alkaline, uh, like lime, uh, you'll get blue. If you expose that to ammonia vapors, they'll turn purple a lot of times. Um, let's see. And here's one of my favorite ones. We talked about this this morning if you were in the iris green cloth lit class, blue to green. And this is something that happens not only with iris, which they called lily a lot of times, but also columbine. And they create about the same kind of color. Um, all the recipes call for alum. Some call for burnt alum, which I have not tried yet. And often they call for the addition of calcium, either quicklime, which is calcium oxide or calcium carbonate, often in a seashell form. And so when you make this one, you get kind of a bluish green clothlet. But when you put the clothlet into a seashell, it turns green with the addition of the calcium carbonate leaching out of the seashell. Uh, you can also make it directly into the seashell without infusing it onto a clothlet. I think that one's a little bit easier. Some say to add a little bit of sugar or lemon juice. That's going to change your chemistry a little bit, and you're going to get a little bit different of a color. If you do use quicklime, be careful. Just a tiny little bit will change the color dramatically. And there are lots of different recipes for this in the Paduan manuscript and Bolognese and manuscripts of Jahan Lebeg, which are all in the medieval treatises book by Merrifield, and also De Arte Illuminandi, which is a separate book, um, kind of hard to get, but it's an Italian source, I believe about 15th century. So we can go from blue to green. We can also go from green to blue. Uh, things like indigo and woad, were used as pigments. And uh, when you uh, ferment these, they turn from um, green to blue. And uh, this is a hydrolysis process. And uh, you're going from indican to uh, leuco indigo to indigo. And it's the same basic chemical in both of them, just in different proportions. And at times, uh, it, England was a big producer of woad, and there were times where they uh, would not let other countries uh, import indigo to protect their woad. Um, woad doesn't have quite as much indigo in it as uh, true indigo, which is indigo ferra. I'll pause for a quick question or two while I get a drink here. Not a question, but I'm the one teaching the indigo class later today. So I'm like, yes, yes, that. <laughs> I have the, I the you then because I'm your uh, TA. <laughs> I have I have the full quote of them prohibiting uh, indigo. Um, I love that quote. It's one of the best things. Um, it, it's fascinating stuff. It's so good. <laughs> uh, so buckthorn. Uh, this is kind of interesting because depending on when you pick the berries it determines what color you're going to get. If you pick immature berries, you're going to get uh, yellow, or it's kind of an orangish yellow that you're seeing in the pictures there. And when they are fully ripe, uh, you'll get what they call sap green, which is a nice, pretty yellow, greenish color. Uh, and the berries usually become ripe about September, uh, here in the United States, uh, buckthorn or ramnus is a uh, invasive species. So if you are looking for this stuff, you very well may, may be able to find it in wetter areas. Um, but please, if you can, maybe pull it out when you're done. <laughs> uh, they grow into uh, bushes that kind of take over wetlands. Uh, no binder is necessary for this one. It has its own kind of stickiness, and the alum that you add makes it more permanent. Uh, it could be made into an ink, into a transparent um, 
uh, pigment or into a lake pigment where you could make it a bit more opaque. And again, lots of different manuscripts that you can find these recipes in. So lead, uh, lead was hugely important. Yes, they knew it was poisonous, but it was the absolute best white you had back then. Uh, they didn't have a white that was even close until the late 1800s, early 1900s with titanium white. So they were using lead forever. Um, the lead, you start out with a sheet of lead, you suspend it over an acid like urine or vinegar, and then you get a, a coating on that of a metal salt um, where it kind of tarnishes, and that's the white that you scrape off. Now you can refine this when you grind it with water to make it a bit more um, pure and it'll uh, not, uh, it's more, um, it won't change as much. And then you can roast that white to yellow and then to orange and then to red. So pretty much all you're doing is putting it over a fire and heating it up. Uh, of course, this is going to produce some noxious fumes. I do not suggest doing this at home, uh, but if you do, please take all due precautions because you're dealing with something that is producing a poisonous vapor and uh, will produce a poison in itself. Okay, vermilion. This is another highly poisonous one because it is made from mercury. Uh, and they really did know how poisonous it was. Uh, Chinini says, don't make this one yourself. It's not worth it. Just buy it from the apothecary, uh, <laughs> who was oftentimes your uh, pigment dealer. Um, and... Uh, Pliny the Elder uh, mentions vermilion and manufacturing it, and he mentions how the people were wearing face masks because they knew how poisonous it was, and it will give off a mercuric vapor. Um, you can get this stuff naturally as cinnabar. If you manufacture it, it's usually called vermilion. Uh, Theophilus in On Diverse Arts, which is a pretty early manual, uh, says if you want to make cinnabar, take sulfur. There are three kinds. You're breaking it up, um, mixing the sulfur with um, mercury, and then heating it up. A lot of times you'll hear like there's a crashing sound or the fumes will change color or whatever, and that's when you know when it, it's done. We have a couple questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you find the colors mentioned in the manuscripts uh, that you're discussing were made with dye sources available in the area, or if these manuscripts were created with dye sources uh, available through far off trade routes? We'll go with that uh, and then we've got it, another one. Yeah, it's kind of 50 50. Uh, there are some that were definitely around there, some of them that you would have been making on your own, but a lot of it was imported even way in the beginning. They found Egyptian blue in one of the early Celtic manuscripts. So uh, there was definitely a lot of trade in, um, in pigments. And if you're interested in that, I taught a class on that at uh, Known World Heraldic last year, and you can find the video online. And the next question is, the discussion of toxic fumes raises a tangential question. I know that tanneries were considered noxious fumes. Uh, generally just noxious, uh, and in many cases were restricted to out operating outside city limits and or specific social classes. Were dye works also considered to be noxious, generally speaking? Uh, definitely some of them. Um, I know some of them you're using stuff like stale urine, and it, it smells funky, uh, especially if you're making something like Tyrian purple. Um, there is a reference to being able to um, divorce your spouse if they smell like Tyrian purple because that's rotting snails and it just kind of gets into everything. Uh, so definitely there was some of that. Some of this isn't so much. 
Um, but yeah, definitely some areas were uh, devoted to the more uh, dangerous or stinky things. <laughs> Anything else? so far in the chat? Okay. And I'm sorry my, my son is having a hard time today. Um, come here, buddy. Okay. You wanna you wanna hang out with me? You wanna hang out? Okay. You gotta stop crying, but you can hang out. Okay. Um so there were a couple of different ways. There were a couple of different ways to make things like vermilion. And the big one at the time was the Dutch method. And uh it's it's a very specific um 100 parts mercury to 20 parts sulfur. And you're making the mercuric sulfur and then crushing and heating it. And then uh, it'll change from black to red. And uh, you're going to have a little bit of extra sulfur in there. And you're going to uh, remove that with a strong alkali, wash it out, and, uh, and grind it underwater so that you don't get all of the dust uh, coming into your lungs. Uh, so some of the recipes that you see in manuscripts are going to be kind of weird. And this is <laughs> a very weird one. Uh, <laughs> you're putting uh, mercury into an egg, which may have worked a little bit because you're going to have some sulfur in there and the mercury that you're adding. And you may be able to get some uh, mercuric sulfide, but I'm not sure how much. Uh, in here they're burying it and then there is an animal that is going to break out of it you let that animal die preserve it and it will fall into powder and this is what you use for your vermilion and i'm not exactly sure what they were seeing coming out of this egg but i'm sure it did kind of look like an animal maybe sprouting out of there so burnt earth colors uh Earth colors like um, sienna uh, or umber uh, come out of the ground a certain color, but you can change that to make it a little bit more reddish. And you can do that by heating it up until it glows like charcoal. Um, again, be a little bit careful. You don't know what vapors are going to be coming out of this. So I suggest if you want to do this, do it outside. Uh, but your iron oxide is... Um, uh, uh, interacting with the manganese oxide and uh, partially becoming hematite, which makes it a little bit more red. And we get the word Siena from the city-state of Siena in Italy. And umber was from the Umbrian region of Italy. You were getting a lot of earth colors from Italy. Um, everything from green to black to white to uh, red. And um, some of these were being shipped out and some of them were being used there. Earth colors are great because they do not change color or fade uh, like a lot of the um, organic colors. Uh, so there are more metal salts uh, other than just lead. And one of the big ones was uh, copper, which again, Chinini is saying that you're using alchemy uh, to create verdigris. Uh, so again, you're just suspending a metal sheet over some sort of acid like uh, vinegar or urine, and you get a copper acetate. And you just scrape that off. You can refine it and uh, make it more stable uh, just by grinding it with water or uh, with vinegar. If you grind it with water, it's likely to turn brown, um, just like copper is. Uh, let's see. And again, lots of different recipes. This was probably one that you would be making yourself, buying some copper and then making it. Um, verdigris is kind of weird in that it 
is kind of acidic and it may uh, burn through your um, parchment um, or paper. There are plenty of um, instances of this happening, but if you refine it a little bit more, it will become more stable and hopefully not uh, damage your stuff. And some of these would also react to each other, which we will talk about in a little while. And here we go, unintended changes. We may have degradation, interactions, or tarnishes. Uh, anything before I get into the unintended consequences? No, but we've got the uh, mental image in chat. Uh, somebody read the loot it as yeet it. Uh, and so now we have the mental image of yeeting an egg full of mercury. Across. <laughs> so I figured I should at least share that with you because it yeah. the heck out of me. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Do not suggest. Don't make yeah. mercury. Do not try this at home. <laughs> Catch. Okay, so let's get into light fastness. Again, this is when uh, light or um, either UV or another kind interacts with your pigment and makes it fade. Um, some are more light fast than others. Some that are really light fast are something like matter and indigo. And these are ones that you see being used as clothing dyes quite a bit. And some are less light fast, but were still used in some manuscripts like saffron or turmeric. Um, and these were okay in books because they were being closed and you weren't getting a whole lot of light um, interacting with them. Chinini mentions that saffron will lose its color when exposed to air. And he also says this about weld. Um, and uh, weld and indigo, if you can bind those two, you get like a Robin Hood green, which is just a beautiful color. Okay, azurite degradation. Uh, sometimes azurite can turn black. Uh, some people believe that this is malachite turning into peritasimite uh, and uh, turning kind of greenish. Uh, Chinini believes that malachite was created from azurite um, <laughs> and was only partially natural. Uh, these two are pretty much the same chemical, azurite and malachite, and they hang out together a lot of times. It's hard to find them actually individual. Uh, so what I believe Chinini was seeing was uh, just azurite and malachite being mixed together, and he thought that the uh, malachite was being formed from the azurite. Uh, but azurite can turn either black or green over time a little bit. Uh, it's not something that happens quickly, and it's not something that happens over uh, all of the azurite. A lot of the really pretty dark blues that you would think might be ultramarine are actually azurite which was the most common uh, mineral blue being used in manuscripts at the time. And some of these will interact and turn nasty colors. Uh, so medieval artists knew about these. Um, if you see the Celtic manuscripts with the little yellow dots all around the initials or something, that's because orpiment does not play well with things like lead. It will turn black. Um, yeah, a lot of different manuscripts are saying about this, don't mix lead white and verdigris or orpiment because they're going to interact with each other. Don't interact uh, orpiment or aminium with um, verdigris and things like that. Um, yeah. And Chinini, verdigris and lead are mortal enemies and will turn each other different colors. Um, mostly what you're getting is the lead turning black. Uh, more interactions, verdigris may react to sulfur and turn black. Uh, verdigris may also eat through your paper or parchment, as we said. Uh, lead may interact with hydrogen sulfide in the air and turn it black. Um, and Chinini knew about this. He was mostly a uh, um, 
painter on walls and he saw where the lead white had turned uh, black on walls. Uh, and this can happen as well with orpiment and vermilion. Uh, they think that vermilion is being turned into medicine bar, which is a black uh, color in egg tempera when exposed to light. And again, Chinini says, don't use vermilion on walls because this can happen. But you can counteract this and a lot of other things by kind of sealing them in. Uh, Chinini says to use a red glaze of matter kermes or cochineal, and that will decrease the reaction if you do something like uh, put glare over top of your uh, lead white that can help seal it in as well. And our last one is metal tarnishing. And this, is, this was a big problem with silver. That's why you see gold more often in illumination and less with silver. It's because a lot of times it turns black when it's oxidized. And again, you can kind of uh, decrease this by keeping it away from the air by putting a binder like gum arabic or glare over top of your silver. I've got a whole bunch of sources here and uh, I can make my um, my uh, slides available so that you have access to these. There's some papers in here and some um, books. If you're going to get a book about uh, pigments, I highly suggest The Craftsman's Handbook or Il Libro dell'Arte by Cennini, 15th century Italian uh, manuscript, and it's only like $12 on Amazon. So any questions before we uh, turn some things, some pretty colors? We do have a couple questions in chat. Yay. Um, there is one that's kind of general to the group. Um, uh, Jen Peters was doing some experiments making a sort of fake azurite blue ink out of indigo based uh -huh. on a period recipe. Uh -huh. uh, and they couldn't seem to get it to be any lighter than a very dark blue, practically black. Uh, have you or anyone else in class class looked into that sort of thing? Uh, if you're getting really, really dark, um, what I would try and do is add a little bit of um, either chalk or maybe titanium white or something and try and grind that in. Yeah, a, a lot of times it's going to be really dark and uh, almost black. Um, and it could be from modern extraction methods too. I don't know if you're working with uh, indigo dye or the actual leaves, but yeah, indigo is kind of, I've been trying to make it into a lake. Uh, if I try and use it too much as is, it's just really, really dark. Yeah, um, I forgot that my modern name was going to be the one that showed up in chat <laughs> through Google. Um, <laughs> and mostly, I just didn't want to interrupt the conversation or the what you were talking about at the time. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, basically, a friend of mine um, had been looking into it. She couldn't make uh, the pigment work at all, but huh. that was because she ended up using um, indigo hair dye, which is vastly different than oh. <laughs> indigo actual dye. So, yeah. Um, but she was trying to she was asking me how to um or what she had done wrong and it's like this um <laughs> but i was trying it myself and um yeah it's like i'm using powdered indigo uh, but mm -hmm. natural powdered indigo um i do have japanese indigo plants but i'm saving those leaves for a bigger project later yeah. um <laughs> and uh yeah it was just the recipe seemed like a wildly huge amount of indigo but then i realized you have to like squeeze out the liquid so that makes a little bit more sense and yeah it just was really 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 dark so just yeah. curious mostly and you may be able to use some of your exhausted dye bath to make uh pigments with uh try and make a lake out of it um but yeah yeah fair okay thanks uh there's another tangential question in chat uh awesome. red sorry i only get the name that google provides uh managed to get their hands on a small quantity of powdered Tyrian purple powder. Oh, uh, wow. It is insoluble in water. Uh, any suggestions for a carrier liquid slash dyeing method? <laughs> <laughs> the natural dyers are like, oh, hello. Uh, but oh, man. We're in Marion's class, so we're going to let Marion 
Oh man, I, I would be afraid to even do anything with that because it's so uh, rare and expensive. Um, man, I don't even know. Because <laughs> the usual way you deal, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, I, I was, you can, you feel free to answer. I just, I also know that um, Tyrion Purple was, um, uh, it's derived from the mollusks, of course, and actually part of that, part of the reason it's purple is because there's indigo in there. Yeah. Um, so if you, it, because it's insoluble in water, if you use an indigo method, like making an alkaline bath and getting a reducing agent and stuff like that, it probably would work. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it, uh, it functions in the same way as indigo when I did a little bit of research on it for my for for my version of the indigo chemistry class, and I look forward to taking the other version of the indigo chemistry class so that I can see all the things I missed. Um, yeah, you totally treat it. It's in the same family. You basically treat it like indigo, but also kind of like gold. Uh, not literal gold, like figurative, oh my God, it's expensive, yeah. amazing, and I'm kind of jealous gold. Um, I'm very same, jealous. Same, yeah. Um, another question in chat before the natural dyers go a little crazy over the Tyrian purple. Uh, was uh, Celadon the color used outside of Asia in medieval times? Yeah, this this stuff is coming from all over, even the New World. Uh, you will see Kermes and Cochineal, mm -hmm. and they're very similar little insects and produce a very similar color. Uh, Cochineal has a lot more dye in it, but Cochineal was coming mainly from the New World. Uh, already in late 1400s and then all through the 1500s and uh, into uh, quite a ways after that. And so, yeah, there was huge um, trade routes of this kind of stuff. Just tons of it being shipped. Would that make cochineal, a cochineal more or less rare in its use, the fact that it has uh, shipped? So as trade routes with the New World increased, they were getting a lot of it and they were using it more often because you can get so much, it's like 10 times more dye from Cochineal than Kermes. Uh, so it was becoming a lot more common than Kermes was. Um, the British Redcoats, that's Cochineal. Um, so that's a little bit out of our uh, period, but yeah, uh, later period, you're uh, going to be seeing Cochineal a lot more than Kermes. Thank you. Okay. Let's have a little fun with chemistry. So what I have here is Brazil wood. And it's kind of an orangish color. It's pretty boring. We're going to add a little bit of alum. And that's going to start a chemical change. And we're getting... A little bit more of a orangish red and a lot of the red um, inks that you see are either going to be and here's a control so you can kind of see what color change we got there but your red inks were either going to be brazil wood or something like vermilion so Alum has a little bit of acid in there, and that's why we're getting the change, because our Brazil wood is pH sensitive. And unfortunately, I can't find my um, cream of tartar, which would have turned it a nice yellow, but we'll be getting some reds today. So this is potash, and this is getting a lot brighter color immediately. And again, here's our control. Uh, so there's a recipe for potash, quick lime, um, cream, uh, tartar, and one other color. Uh, I think just the orange that it's originally, and it's just different colors from uh, different additions. So our last one is going to be quick lime, and that is our most crazy change. Uh, I mentioned this morning in um, the uh, iris green clothlet class, if you add quicklime, be very careful because it will not take very much and you will get a very dramatic change. So let's see, we got this, add our stuff, and it's just a little bit and we immediately get like a magenta color. And 
our control. And that's just a little bit. So these are very uh, pH sensitive and you're gonna get a lot of different colors. So we have our control, alum, potash, and quicklime. That is so awesome. I, um, I've always struggled as a natural dyer to get red with Brazil wood. In fact, I got a very, very nice like 90s purple once, <laughs> which was fascinating. Um, but uh, it's only been in the last little while that somebody was like, oh, by the way, it's pH sensitive. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I, I usually end up with a lake pigment that's like a really bright magenta. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, but kind of fun. Yeah. I get my try using, try, try using Kensic water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm, <laughs> in, order, in order to get that, in order to get that color um, variation, you have to add every single ingredient to to one. Or did you add just potash? I added uh, just potash, just okay. quick lime. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. I, I miss saw then because I thought you were like, and here's when I add alum and here's when <laughs> I add alum and potash. And I was just very, I was a little confused. I apologize. Oh, no, no, that's fine. And when I make a uh, lake pigment, I usually do Brazil wood with a little bit of potash, which will help kind of leach out the color a little bit and also change the pH. And uh, then when I'm making it into the lake, I uh, strain off all the organic material, put it into a pot, add a little bit of heat so that you get a little bit more energy for your chemical reaction. And then I add alum and whatever calcium carbonate I'm using. So a lot of times it is quite a few different chemicals that I'm using. But each one has its own uh, reaction to the dye molecule. Okay. I'm just going to nip in here with a brief uh, administrative note. If you are aiming to acquire uh, Atlantean degree credits, you should head to the site and you mark yourself attended sometime this week. There's not a rush. They don't, you know, you don't have to do it in the next 15 minutes to count or anything. Uh, but I have not taken attendance. So if you want credit, you have to give yourself credit. So FYI, just know for that for fact. Some TAs are much more um, on the ball and take attendance, but I feel that a couple people have either lost connection or slipped out. So I don't want to, I want to make sure that everybody who's still here heard that. So. Right on. I, I would greatly appreciate your, your slides and um, the recorded video when available because your class is amazingly informative and one of the best dye classes that I've taken. And I don't dye, so I don't understand this shit. And you're the one that I've understood the easiest. Um, <laughs> in that same vein, is there anyone or, or even the teacher who would be able to suggest a resource or book that I would be able to look up a color and get a list of what possibly could have made because I'm the one asking about fabrics trying to retroactively create or, or at least find the possible sources for um, the dyes that were created in embroidery piece. And there's, is, is there any way to, outside of researching the sources for every single thing that could this red color, one that says, oh, if you want red, try these things. The, the thing is, is things that were used changed by time and place. Um, so if you want to be absolutely sure of what it's going to be, I would look for research. Um, but uh, let's see, it's a web exhibit. Um, let me see here if I can find it quick. Nikki, not yet. Just give me a few minutes, okay, buddy? <laughs> Go ask Katie. Um, uh, exhibits pigments. Okay, pigments through the ages. I will uh, send a link to this. This is one of the 
quickest and easiest ways to start to figure out what may have been used. This is definitely not an exhaustive list of things that were used. I found a lot more that haven't been. Uh, you are also more than welcome to email me. Uh, I will put my email in the chat here and uh, upstairs. And dragonflyscribeblog.wordpress.com. That's my blog. Uh, feel free to tag me anytime and ask any questions or uh, skim my blog. I've written a lot about the different colors I've been able to get there and different um, recipes. Uh, I can at least uh, point you in the right direction there. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No and problem. I do appreciate everyone who's been commenting with all additional suggestions for the fabrics and, and the differences between pigments and dyes and what works with protein and, and uh, yeah, I would. I just wanted to jump in just so that you don't frustrate the snot out of yourself. <laughs> Natural dyes and dyeing fabric is a different chemical process than making pigments. Yes. They're related. They're yes. like kissing cousins, but they're not the same. So don't, don't like... Right. Yeah. Kind of don't don't read to... one and go. This is totally going to make my cohardy beautiful. Oh no no! I'm not going to make to... yourself sad, and I don't <laughs> want sad people. It's bad. Oh, totally appreciate that. I am not going to be doing any no, of the cool. creation or the dying. I just need it for the documentation because I'm a rabbit hole queen. Oh, and totally dying. Dying to pigments. They're so much fun. You get to yeah. mix so many colors. It's amazing. Um, so. And then your house maybe. smells funky funky and it's great and you know <laughs> yeah which is exactly why maybe after i move out of my parents house <laughs> uh, i got into thank an argument so with someone about sorry, oh, sorry go ahead no i was just saying thank you so much this has been like i said the best die class that i've taken and i've been trying to take these for the past three universities trying <laughs> to understand so i i really really appreciate it it's been a really good class yeah, and if anybody's interested in pigments, please come to the Known World Heraldic and Scribal uh, the second weekend in July. There's going to be a couple of classes I'm teaching on pigments and a couple of classes taught by uh, Kit uh, on um, pigments. So come and check it out. And I believe it is uh, now time to... We, we have hit our 10 minute mark uh, with 10 minutes till the hour. So now is a good time for everybody to remember to get up, stretch, remind your body that it does not actually remain in this seated at the computer position. Uh, get yourself a drink of water, use the restroom. Um, and thank you so much, Marianne, for sharing all of your knowledge. It's amazing. I'm gonna make sure to end the recording so that it doesn't just go on forever. <laughs> um, 